Welcome to Grace Life Church. I'm David Kinneberg, one of the teaching elders here at Grace Life. We want to thank you for joining us online and listening to our sermons online. Hope they are a blessing and encouragement to you. If you want more information, you can check out our website at glcanoka.org. Thanks and God bless. Verses 17 through 29. So I invite you to open your Bibles to that passage. Before we delve into it, though, I think it'd be good for us to be a reminder of the needs of many people, as you're well aware, I'm sure, suffering still from the effects of Hurricane Helene, which about a week and a half ago brought devastating floods across the southeastern portion of the U.S. The death toll from Helene has risen to over 220 across six states. And about half the victims were in North Carolina, while dozens more were killed in Georgia and South Carolina. It caused many people to evacuate their homes, not knowing if they would still have a place to live after the storm. The damage left many North Carolina families in disbelief and disorder. However, the Volunteers of Samaritan's Purse were the first people to come in and bring peace to the place we call home in its toughest time of need. To encourage us in praying for these families, here's a brief video of how they helped a North Carolina family recover from overwhelming Hurricane Helene damage. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for the people affected by Hurricane Helene. We ask for miracles of provision and restoration and healing. We know that nothing is too hard for you, God. You are the God of all comfort, who is near to the brokenhearted. And Lord, we stand on the gap for North Carolina and every state damaged by Helene. We pray for supplies to reach the people still trapped, and for power, water, and telephone service to be restored quickly. Refresh and revive those working tirelessly to help the communities, including the first responders and Samaritan's Purse. In a time of greatest weakness, Lord, let your light shine. We pray for the salvation of those who don't know you. Let them see your love demonstrated through the churches and believers working together to help the community. And Lord, as we anticipate time together in your word this morning, we recall that your servant David, whom you called a man after your own heart, prayed in Psalm 19 that the words of his mouth and the thoughts of his heart might be acceptable to you. With that in mind, I pray that the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts would also be pleasing to you as we examine our passage in Romans 2. And in so doing, we pray that you will teach us by your Spirit from your words so that we can apply it to our daily lives and be more conformed to the image of your Son. For Jesus' sake, amen. A story from the March 1990 edition of Reader's Digest tells of a pastor who had been preaching on the importance of daily Bible reading. He and his wife were invited for a meal at a parishioner's home. And while there, the pastor's wife saw a note that the hostess had written on a kitchen calendar, Pastor and Mrs. for dinner, dust all Bibles. <laughs> you know, hypocrisy, presenting ourselves as something that we know we're not, is one of the most subtle and dangerous of sins. Seven times in Matthew 23, Jesus thundered against the religious leaders of his day, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! In Luke 12, he warned his disciples, Beware or be on guard against the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Leaven, which today we more commonly call yeast, I guess, it spreads subtle and pervasively until the whole lump of dough is affected. And so does hypocrisy. It's a perpetual danger for the religious, especially for religious leaders. We'll see later that it's the root sin that Paul confronts in our text for today. Someone has said nothing is as easy to counterfeit as Christianity. Most people believe that being a Christian and being religious are one and the same. But being a Christian and being religious are two different things. You know, it's possible to be a Christian without being religious. In fact, Fritz Ridenauer, who's 92 right now, but uh, he was earlier in life the 
youth editor of Gospel Light Publications back in the 1960s. And he wrote a little book entitled, How to Be a Christian Without Being Religious. I've got the 1971 edition. There's also a picture of the 2002. But it's a study of the book of Romans. And in it, he talks about religious hypocrisy. And he shows how religion, or why religion, has failed and points to true Christianity and a faith that is more than so-called fire insurance. Well, not only is it possible to be a Christian without being religious, but it's also possible to be religious without being a Christian. Many people believe that being religious is a good thing. However, those same people fail to realize that religion will send them straight to hell. Hell, you see, will be just as filled with religious folks as it will be with rank sinners. So it's not what we do externally that saves our souls, but it's what happens internally that determines where we will spend eternity. Christianity, you see, isn't a religion. Rather, it's a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard is widely recognized as the father of existentialism, which is a philosophical belief that individuals create the meaning and essence of their lives as opposed to any deities or authorities creating it for them. Kierkegaard looked around Copenhagen in the 19th century, and he saw a lot of so-called Christians, but as he said, they were Christians in quotation marks. They owned unread Bibles that were probably also dusty, and they belonged to unattended churches. And even more tragic, they never encountered the living God. Theirs was a powerless religion. They had a Bible and even a knowledge of God, but it did them no good. How sad it is that many people are religious but not redeemed. Well, in the first two chapters of Romans, Paul shows the universal guilt of mankind. In Romans 1, he says the Gentiles are guilty before God because of their sin. They are unrighteous, depraved sinners. In Romans 2, he says the Jews are guilty before God because of their sin. They are self-righteous, moral sinners. You know, it's not easy to convince a moral person of his or her guilt because moral people truly believe that they're better than others. The Jews are probably in agreement with Paul concerning his statements about the judgment of the wicked. You know, we're often the same way. When we hear about certain groups coming under judgment, we tend to get all self-righteous and say, Amen! You know, but we ought to check up on ourselves and be sure that we're not living in deception either. For us who are believers in Jesus Christ, nothing could be worse than dying and then finding ourselves disqualified at the judgment seat of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul challenges Christians saying, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Now, this is not to determine if... if uh, we are truly justified or born again, but to see whether, as he says, we are in the faith. In other words, we are to examine ourselves to see if Christ's abiding presence is being revealed in us. Paul's desire was for the church at Corinth and all believers to live pleasing and obedient lives to the Lord and therefore to receive his approval at the judgment seat of Christ. Well, in verses 17 through 20 of Romans 2, Paul describes the privilege of the Jews. He writes, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast of your relationship to God and know his will and approve the superior things because you receive instruction from the law, and if you are convinced that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an educator of the senseless, a teacher of little children because you have in the law the essential features of knowledge and of the truth. Now, Paul is here dealing with the question, who is a real Jew? You know, previously called Hebrews and Israelites, by the first century, the term Jew had become the most common name for the descendants of Abraham through Isaac. The Jews were the toughest group to deal with because they were so deeply devoted to their religious heritage. We know from Scripture that the Jews traced their descendants back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God made a covenant with the Jews in the Old Testament. It was a covenant of land and a covenant of people. 
In 70 AD, the Roman general Titus came to Jerusalem and destroyed the city, and it fell. And from that time, the nation of Israel vanished from the face of the earth. It did not exist for hundreds of years. There was no nation of Israel in 310 AD when Constantine ruled the world. There was no nation of Israel on earth in the Middle Ages. There was no nation of Israel during the days of the American Civil War. There was no nation of Israel in the days of World War I, World War II, or the Great Depression. But on May 14, 1948, the nation of Israel was reborn, and it grew, and today it has a government, government, and it's actually been granted a charter by the United Nations. It had been almost 1,900 years since Israel was alive. It had been dead for almost 1,900 years, but God has revisited Israel. She has a renewed covenant, and God is again at work in Israel. The Jews were a chosen people and a privileged people, and the Jews were confident and took great pride in their race, their revelation from God, and their responsibility. By the way, things are lining up very prophetically for Israel. As Dan mentioned earlier, tomorrow marks the one-year anniversary of the Hamas terrorist attacks on Israel. In the early morning hours of October 7, 2023, the Islamic resistance movement known as Hamas, which has governed the Israeli-occupied Gaza Strip since 2007, it launched a surprise attack with thousands of rockets into Israel, aiming to overwhelm the, dome, the Iron Dome system, and then they bulldozed their way through the border using explosives, speedboats, and paragliders. It was the bloodiest attack in all of Israel's history. More Jews were killed on October 7th than on any day since the Holocaust. Since that date, more than 1,300 Jews or Israelis were killed, with another 3,300 injured. And now that's in a country whose population is less than 10 million. In America, that would actually be equivalent to killing nearly 40,000 people. It's 13 times more than the number of Al-Qaeda victims on 9-11. You probably wouldn't know that from our state-run media. And terrorists are still holding over 100 men, women, and children in captivity in Gaza. In fact, Iran helped to plan Hamas's attack on Israel and gave approval for the assault at a meeting in Lebanon's capital of Beirut the week before the attack took place. Israel truly is surrounded by enemy countries on all sides. The Islamic states surrounding Israel are 650 times larger, and yet Israel is considered by some as the dangerous aggressor. It's a reminder to us of what Jesus said in Luke 21, 20 to his disciples on Mount Olivet about the end times and the destruction of Jerusalem. He said, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies or enemies, then know that its desolation is near. This means that Jerusalem will fall under Gentile domination in the future tribulation period just before our Messiah, Jesus, returns to restore Jerusalem. He will return with the church, his bride, on white horses as foretold in Revelation 19. And all the prophesied nations and places are, following, are falling into place rapidly. And this can only mean that the imminent rapture of the church, which precedes the tribulation, is drawing even closer. Israel today makes up only 3% of the original promised land. It's roughly the same size as New Jersey, the fifth smallest U.S. state and tiny compared to the rest of the Arab world surrounding it. By the way, it is called Israel, not Palestine. Israel doesn't merely occupy the land, they own it. There has never been an independent state of Palestine in all of world history. The land that God promised to Abraham incorporated much more than the small sliver of land today called Israel. It includes all of Jordan, all of Lebanon, and most of Syria. 
In Genesis 15, 18, God promised Abraham, saying, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, I will give this to your offspring from the brook of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates River. Israel will take all the land that God promised to Abraham from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates, as we're told in Genesis 15, 18. And that promise was given about 2,000 years before Christ. It will happen one day, friends. How much of that might we see here from earth or get to view from heaven? Well, that remains to be seen. But Jesus is coming to rapture his church, as foretold in 1 Thessalonians 4. The timing, restraint, redemption, and resurrection are all in God's sovereign hands. Well, as we move on, uh, breaking down this passage a little bit more, in verse 17a, the first part of verse 17, we see that one of Israel's privileges was that it took pride in was their name. Paul writes, if you call yourself a Jew, and that was always first. When Paul calls them Jews, you can almost feel the pride that he felt. After all, they were God's chosen people. They were privileged among all the people of the world, people of the covenant with God. To them was committed the ancient law of God. The prophets and kings belonged to them as did Moses. That English term Jew is originally de derived from the Hebrew term Yehudi, which is taken from the name of the tribe of Judah. And it literally means praise. When Jews introduced themselves, they would add the word Jew after their name, such as Simon Barjona, Jew. Well, the word Jew first appears in Scripture in its plural form, Yehudim, in 2 Kings 16.6, where it refers to a defeat for the Yehudi army or nation. In 2 Chronicles 32.18, it refers to the Hudit or Hebrew or Judahite language. Jeremiah 34, 8, 9 has the earliest singular use of the word Yehudi. We read there, The Lord spoke to Jeremiah after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people in Jerusalem to grant the slaves their freedom. Everyone was supposed to free their male and female Hebrew, a Hebrew man, Hayibri, or a Hebrewess, Wahabria slaves. No one was supposed to keep a fellow Judean or Jew in the Hebrew Bahudi enslaved. Who was the first Jew? Well, that depends on exactly what is meant by the word Jew. Originally, God's chosen people were known as the Hebrews. And later, after they settled in the Promised Land and formed a nation, they were known as the Israelites. The term Jew actually did not come into use until after the ten northern tribes were exiled into Assyria and Judah was exiled to Babylon. And in the later stages of the captivity during the time of Esther and in the early stages of the return to the land of Israel during Ezra and Nehemiah, the tribe of Judah was dominant. The word Jew then developed as a shortening of the word Judah. But the word Jew was used as a descriptor for more than just the tribe of Judah. The dominance of the tribe of Judah and the return to the promised land resulted in all of the Israelites, people from all 12 of the tribes, being referred to as Jews. So we might ask, who is the first Jew? Well, if by Jew we mean Hebrew, Abraham was the first Jew. If by Jew we mean of the tribe of Judah, Judah was the first Jew. If by Jew we mean the first person in the Bible to be referred specifically as a Jew, the nameless Jews in 2 Kings 16 through 25 were the first Jews. But generally speaking, people today use the term Jew to refer to a person who is of the chosen people of Israel. And then with that in mind, Abraham should be considered the first Jew. Well, in addition to their name, the Jews also took pride in their book, as we're told in verses 17 and 18. Paul continues, you rely on the law and boast of your relationship to God and know his will and approve the superior things because you receive instruction from the law. The law was written with the finger of God himself on Mount Sinai. How much better could you get? You know, the Greeks might have had Plato and Aristotle, but their writings seem like scribble compared to God's writing. 
No wonder the Jews bragged about the law. It gave the Jews a sense of superiority and security. The Jews also took pride in their God. As verse 17 points out, you boast of your relationship to God. The Jews felt that they had a so-called copyright on God. They had a patent on him. That gave exclusive, they had exclusive rights then on God. In verses 19 and 20, we see that the Jews took pride in themselves. Paul writes, and if you are convinced that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an educator of the senseless, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the essential features of knowledge and of the truth, here then the Jews made four boastful claims about themselves. First of all, they were guides to the blind. When one has been given special revelation from God, it becomes his responsibility to teach others the revelation that God has given them. The Jews saw themselves as instructors of the ignorant, referring to the Gentiles. They esteemed themselves qualified to instruct the heathen world. And yet Jesus called the Pharisees blind guides in Matthew 23, and blind leaders of the blind in Matthew 15. They were also lights in the darkness. Again, a light refers to the Jewish teachers, and darkness denotes the ignorance of the Gentile world. But the scribes and Pharisees were legalistic, ritualistic, and works-oriented, and they wanted the Gentiles to become like them. The Jews also considered themselves as educators of the senseless. The Jew thought himself to be qualified to instruct those Gentiles void of understanding without knowledge. And teachers of little children. You know, the blind need guides. And the foolish desperately need instructors. And the infants need teachers. The claim was perfectly sensible and respectable. The performance was something else, though. All three claims of the Jews were outward only. None of those things that touch the heart. And since they don't touch the heart, they can easily be faked. They require no inward change. You know, without a heart change, the Jewish advantage then turns out to be no advantage at all. On verses 21 through 24, Paul mentions the practices of the Jews. He writes, Therefore, you who teach someone else, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who tell others not to commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by transgressing the law. For just as it is written, the name of God is being blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So the Jews are hypocrites because they're guilty of violating their own teachings and the very standards of the law. There's inconsistency, Paul says, between the Jews' profession and their practice between their preaching and their practice. So Paul asks five questions, and the implied answer for each one is yes. They say and do not. You teach others. Are you teaching yourself? You know, the Jews were good at telling others what to do, but when it comes to living up to their own standards, they failed miserably. It's a matter of integrity to practice what we preach. Secondly, you preach against stealing. Do you yourselves steal? Yes, the very people who preach against stealing robbed widows' houses. Thirdly, you say that people should not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? Are you unfaithful? Fourth, you say not to worship idols. Do you practice idolatry? And yes, they were actually consorting with temple prostitutes. And Paul said, fifthly, you brag about possessing the law. Do you honor God? Or do you dishonor God by breaking the law? You know, it's always worse and hurts the cause of Christ more. And it brings reproach in the name of Jesus when believers act like hypocrites because then the name of God is blasphemed. What do people of the world really want to see? What do they really need and deserve? What would make a difference to them? Well, listen to the words of the late, great uh, American poet Edgar Guest in a poem entitled Sermons We See. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely tell the way. The eyes a better pupil and more willing than the ear. 
Fine counsel is confusing, but examples always clear. The best of all preachers are the men who live their creeds, for to see good put in action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it if you'll let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. And the lecture you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lessons by observing what you do. For I might misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. One good man teaches many. Men believe what they behold. One deed of kindness noticed is worth 40 that are told. Who stands with men of honor learns to hold his honor dear. For right living speaks a language which to everyone is, clear, is uh, dear. Through an able speaker charms me, or though an, eager, an able speaker charms me with his eloquence, I say, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. You see, friends, people don't merely believe what we say, only what they see. If the two don't match up, our words will be disregarded. You and I are the only Bible that many people will ever read. The world generally doesn't read the Bible. The world reads the Christian. Well, and finally, in verses 25 through 29, Paul elaborates on the powerlessness of the Jew. He says, For circumcision has its value if you practice the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man obeys the re righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And the physically uncircumcised man, by keeping the law, will judge you to be the transgressor of the law, even though you have the letter in circumcision. For the person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision something that is outward in the flesh, but someone is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart by the spirit and not by the letter. This person's praise is not from people, but from God. So our primary problem in approaching this passage is that circumcision then does not mean to us what it, mean, what it meant to the Jews. You know, to, to us, circumcision is a purely optional physical act performed on young baby boys. Some are circumcised, some are not. Outside of the Jewish faith, few people are circumcised for religious reasons. Most undergo the procedure for hygienic reasons. But to the Jews, circumcision was a holy mark on the body, and as such, it was a physical reminder to the Jewish male that he belonged exclusively to God. God gave circumcision to Abraham and to his descendants as a sign and seal of the sacred relationship that existed between God and the Jewish people. We need to note this carefully. Circumcision, although it was a physical mark on the body, was never meant to be an end in itself. The physical mark was meant to be accompanied by a deep spiritual commitment to God. And where commitment was absent, circumcision soon degenerated into ritualism. And that's roughly what happened over the centuries. Circumcision had become the supreme symbol of Jewish superiority. It was assumed that a man only needed to be circumcised to ensure his place in heaven. But Paul declares that circumcision is useful only if it is accompanied by a changed life. Thus it's better, as Paul notes, to be uncircumcised and truly obey God than to be circumcised and break God's law. And just as the Jew thought his circumcision gave him a special status with God, today many count their church membership, or their baptism, or their denominational affiliation, or any number of things as proof that they're Christians. Like circumcision, these outward signs have meaning only if there is inward reality. What does not make a Jew? Well, notice again in verses 28 and 29, Paul says, For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision something that is 
outward in the flesh, but someone is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is of the heart by the spirit and not by the letter. And the key words in verse 28 then are outward and in the flesh as opposed with or as contrasted with inwardly and of the heart. What does make a Jew? You know, not all Jews are, uh, not all Jews racially are true Jews in the spiritual sense. And not every Jew physically can lay claim to be spiritually what Paul uh, signified that the name Jew was intended to apply. For example, an uncircumcised non-Israelite can be spiritually what the name Jew was a intended to apply. God says that nothing outwardly makes you a Jew. One becomes a Jew when his heart is changed. And as with Abraham and Jacob, one becomes a Jew when he or she believes in Yeshua HaMashiach, in the Hebrew, Jesus the Messiah. The Jews for Jesus is telling people this today. What makes you a Jew is not the culture from which you came, the ritual through which you have gone, the circumstances of your life, or your background, ancestry, or history, but the fact that you have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. That's what makes a true Jew. In Galatians 3.29, Paul also wrote, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So it all boils down to this. In what or whom am I trusting for my eternal salvation? The issue is my relationship to Jesus Christ. And there's only one way to heaven. Only Jesus and Jesus only. Only Jesus can save us. So we must trust in Jesus and him only. And in light of what we've seen today in Romans 2, the question lies before us is, would I describe myself as a religious person or as a redeemed person? Now there's a difference, and that difference will determine where we spend eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that if anyone here today or, or anyone viewing this online is resting upon empty ceremonies or fancy moral standing or decent or good living for their righteousness, that they will see the hopelessness of such justification before you, the God of reality, the God of truth. We pray that they will receive the gift of eternal life that you so freely offer in Jesus Christ our Lord. He alone can change us and set us free. And for those of us, Father, who know Christ, we ask that you help us to avoid living in any deception of self-righteousness and wind up disqualified for future rewards at Christ's judgment seat. Help us to examine ourselves daily to see if Christ's abiding presence is being manifest in us. Help us, Lord, to live pleasing and obedient lives to you so that we may receive your approval. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.